be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see So I will fight if you'll fight Yeah, I will fight but only if you'll fight Oh, we can make it through this Like sailors in a tempest Like sailors in a tempest Together And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see Welcome to those of you who will join us tonight. I'm Andrea Parks, Chief Development Officer of GoTo Foundation, and I am standing in for Danielle Hicks, our Chief Patient Officer, who is away and not able to guide us through this important conversation, as she so does every month. Danielle is my sister, for those of you who don't, don't know. Bonnie is also my mom, who is also joining us remotely and helping guide the conversation. For those who aren't familiar with our Living Room Program, it is a support and education series created specifically with patients and caregivers in mind with the aim of facilitating educational talks from key opinion leaders in a format and in, in, in a language that the lay person can understand. We know that people watching tonight come from around the globe and consist of people who may be at risk living with very varying types of lung cancer and are un undergoing various types of care and caring for somebody who has been impacted by this disease. Whether you're a non-small cell or small cell patient, an early or late stage patient, on targeted therapy, immunotherapy, or chemotherapy, in remission or have relapsed, we are here for you and we believe wholeheartedly that the educated and empowered patients do better. Joining me tonight is our president and CEO, Lori Ambrose. We're thrilled that she is joining us live, not just as a viewer from Washington, D.C., but as moderator. Lori, let me turn to you to kick off our program. Thank you. Uh, Andy, thank you so much. Uh, I'm I'm excited to be here, and as you just said, I'm usually on the other side of this video, watching intently and listening. Uh, so it's it's very humbling to be able to speak with you tonight, and I will be channeling Danielle the whole time, and uh, hoping that we can do the same job that she does with Bonnie every every month for the patients that are listening and watching locally and around the globe. Um, November's Lung Cancer Awareness Month. I'm sure there's not a person on this um, you know, line that isn't aware of that. Uh, and it's very exciting as just a sidebar, I had just gotten off the phone a little bit ago been working very hard to bring national attention to our community through resolutions that Congress enacts to bring greater attention to disease states. And November is Lung Cancer Awareness Month. We'll see congressional action approving a resolution that acknowledges that and, and calls us all to think about how we can bring earlier detection and increased treatment research and just a community strong sense of purpose around our, you know, our work. So do stay tuned because we will likely see a formal passage of a resolution acknowledging this for our community in these days ahead. But it's more than that in November. We also honor veterans who have served our country and uh, uh, just sacrificed so much for us. And that is why we thought tonight's program, our living room, should focus on this very special, underserved and even vulnerable community that is near and dear to our hearts. Uh, we will hear how the VA itself is standing up its lung cancer screening and treatment programs within its medical network, but we, you will also hear how GoTo Foundation 
now with an established and formal partnership with the VA is supporting that effort and providing whatever educational, technical advice that we can, as well as working on access issues and uh, leveraging our centers of excellence network for veterans who need care and support. There's lots to talk about. We couldn't be more excited to try to destigmatize some of the misnomers about what veterans need to know and maybe should expect regarding their screening and treatment and care, but also work to uh, amplify tonight um, how we can guide those veterans who could be at risk to high quality screening and care near them. But most of all, we want everyone to know that we are here at GoTo Foundation um, to, to, to just support you knowing that your life is our mission and that we will do whatever it takes, whatever the need to get it done together. So as we like to say at GoTo, let's go to it and meet our panelists and dive into this wonderful conversation that will flow throughout this next hour. And I'm gonna first turn to Dr. Drew Moganaki uh, to introduce himself and his extraordinary work uh, that he has devoted. I will tell you, I, I, I don't think I have met someone who I've come to know so deeply and well and personally who cares more about his work thinks 100% about the veterans community and, and just lives and breathes how he can be helpful and supportive 24-7. Uh, and as a member of GoTo Scientific Leadership Board, it's just amazing to have you with us tonight, Drew, and to be able to talk about things that you are in the center of that is helping establish uh, this new pathway forward for, for veterans at risk. So share a little bit about your background, how you came to be serving this community. Sure, thanks, Lori. It's been truly a treasure to be a part of this family. Uh, I think going on, what, three or four years now, maybe even longer. Um, I've been in the VA for about 10 years. I am a radiation oncologist. Um, I completed my training at the University of Pennsylvania over a dozen years ago and chose to work in the VA because of uh, my fondness for our national healthcare system, the opportunities for research, uh, and above and beyond all incredible colleagues who are all generally rowing in the same direction with the same purpose to provide the highest quality of care we can for true Americans in this country who are patriotic and represent kind of what our population would look like if they were all to come together and you know, be a part of trying to be part of something greater than themselves. Um, our veterans that I take care of, uh, you can sense there's a brotherhood and a sisterhood amongst them. If you walk through a waiting room of a radiation oncology department at a VA versus a radiation oncology department at our academic affiliate, uh, it's it's night and day. Our veterans are joking, they're telling stories, they're talking about their command units, they're talking about their sergeants that they liked or maybe didn't like. And um, their, our ability to work with them, I mean, it's a team. Our patients are often much more compliant. They show up, <laughs> uh, they rarely cancel. And it's just been a joy to work in the VA. And, and, and you know, I've, over the past decade, I've you know, grown more and more into lung cancer research and advocacy. And I'm happy to share kind of everything I know as far as, you know, my career and what VA medical centers in general can have to offer veterans uh, on this talk tonight. Wonderful. Yay. Thank you, Drew. And Dr. Devika Das, thrilled that you could be with us and are coming to us from Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, but as a section chief of oncology at the Birmingham VA Medical Center, why don't you share with us as well your background and journey to UAB and certainly your work to support this veteran community? Thank you so much for inviting me and for this opportunity. So I've worked at the Birmingham VA for um, about four years now. Um, I trained at UAB and at the Birmingham VA as a resident and a fellow. And the clinic I had as a, as a trainee oncologist at the Birmingham VA was probably the most fruitful and um, an experience that I could never forget. And I am grateful at this point that I get to give back 
by working as a thoracic oncologist there. I've also uh, been a caregiver for a um, family member with lung cancer. So having seen it from both sides, um, this is something I feel very passionate about. So I'm, I'm excited and grateful to be here today. Oh, thank you, Dr. Das. And Julio, you made it. We were worried that you were not going to be able to connect with us, but there you are and wonderful to see you and uh, glad that you can join us in this conversation. Share with those listening your story as an Army, uh, retired U.S. Army uh, veteran and lung cancer survivor. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I've been technically cha challenged this evening. I'm using my iPhone right now. I have all this high speed, $10,000 worth of computers and I can't use them, but my old reliable iPhone finally came through. So it is my honor to be in your presence tonight. Uh, thank you so much for allowing the opportunity to share my story. Um, it, it's been a tough story. I know uh, everyone that faces cancer in their life, uh, it's, it's a tough story. There is no better cancer than others. Although, you know, lung cancer seems to be the worst of all. But um, I would like to start by saying that I proudly served my country for 28 years. I loved every minute of it. I'm a soldier for life. Um, and uh, this, this disease really, really has challenged me uh, for the past year, I was diagnosed exactly a year ago. So I'm a, a one year survivor. I am so happy. Uh, I'm so thankful uh, to God and else and all the smart folks that have gotten me to this point, because if you would have talked to me a year ago, I was a dead man walking. Um, I, 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 I gave up. Uh, I wanted to die instantly. Uh, it was a devastating blow uh, in my life never expected it. I've been in combat situations. I was a combat engineer, a construction engineer. I prepped for battle, never was scared. But when that oncologist took me in that office that one day a year ago and told me that I was diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer, it, it devastated my life. And to today, I still battle with that diagnosis and acceptance. But once again, I thank God and all the people like yourself, your organization, the wonderful doctors like Dr. Drew, he's picked me up off the floor a couple of times. Uh, he's taken good care of me. Um, and I I'm just here to pay it forward, uh, to tell the vets that there is hope out there. And um, we have great people, we are in great hands. There is a great mm -hmm. system sometimes, it's cumbersome to get things done. But if you're persistent and you know, you're know you're dedicated to your health, in your life and you want to live longer and you want to spend more time with your loved ones, you know, and, 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 and help others. This is the way to do it. You know, you just can't, can't stay in a box by yourself and, and, and not go out there and help others. So, um, once again, thank you for the opportunity to share my story. Uh, I was a non-smoker. Um, uh, I was in the best shape of my life a year ago. I was flying really high was going to the gym five times a week, you know, I mean, three times a week, you know, uh, exercising five times a week, doing all these wonderful things, you know, unbeatable. And then one day I was shot down by a missile. I was misdiagnosed. Uh, I was having right shoulder pain on my back. And due to the fact that I was in pretty decent shape, my PCM, when I went to the VA, they said, oh, there's nothing. It's just, you got something wrong, you could pull the muscle, your shoulder braid, maybe your ribs, you know, you overworked yourself. And this went on for about 10 months till one day I couldn't take it anymore. I had to go into my pulmonologist. He took a scan and said, man, your, your, your pleura is full of fluid. Well, you got a problem here. And that's when the whole stuff came out, the, the monster came out and, uh, but once again, you know, uh, there, there's, there's so many resources out here to get you through that battle. Um, I was never prepared. Um, and once again, I, I, I thank God and all of you that are doing the research. And, but my main point of, my main point is to advocate for early screening. I know everyone's on that bandwagon right now, but you know, lung cancer has a bad stigma. We're not really fully funded like we should be. And, you know, more people die from lung cancer every year 
135,000 plus, more than all the cancers put together. And I don't, I don't have to tell the smart folks that, but I didn't know any of this. I was just totally in the dark. And, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. You know, I'm, I'm blessed. You know, I have, I have a lot to live for and, and, and I live, you know, the old cliche day to day. So thank you again. I don't want to take all your time, but I'm here to help the best I can. Oh. Well, yeah, I just, I just have goosebumps. Just your story is, is so inspirational and, and just your sharing it. And to those that are listening is the hope and the, the sense of resilience that, that they need to hear. So you are paying it forward by, by just being here and, and, and just sharing the story in the way that you are and, and offering the kind of real, um, real personal experiences that so many others actually are going through and are saying at this moment, I am sure, oh my gosh, I can relate to that. And look at, look at, look at you thriving and, um, and, and motivating. So it's powerful, Julio, and we're going to talk more about this and the experience and advice that you can be giving others that are watching. Um, Drew, if I can turn back to you though, because what Julio was touching on is something very interesting. And I do want to talk about the VA system itself, but um, what is driving higher incidence and higher mortality in our military, our veteran population than the civilian population? Maybe you can speak to that a little bit and particularly someone who experiences this as a non-smoker. Yeah, so um, I do have a background in epidemiology and uh, which helps me realize how difficult it is to measure these sorts of things with regards to, uh, you know, do we truly have a higher incidence among veterans and, and what is it? There's so many confounding factors, but in general, what's important to know is that when a soldier signs up for service, they, uh, in the past, uh, more so than today, we're likely exposed to chemicals and toxins that we just weren't aware of their carcinogenic effects. Uh, whether if it's you know working around uh, ammunitions, um, whether if it's using materials to paint or strip uh, fighter planes, uh, whether if it's cleaning supplies in an aircraft carrier, whether if it's um, you know combust combusted materials in a field of battle, and of course as as we we increasingly hearing about these days, whether if it's inhaling uh, dark black smoke coming out of a huge burn pit where they're just throwing all sorts of junk in the desert that they is going to be cheaper to burn than to bring back to the to the states, uh, including tires, human waste, um, canvas, buckets of chemicals, bleach. Uh, you know the fumes coming out would be colorful, not just black or gray. Um, you know, and even even you know trucks and, and Humvee vehicles were were pushed into these burn pits and just blazed. And I've met veterans who just were downstream from the smoke, from the smoke just inhaling this material. So this is from conventional, you know, service. But of course, we know from the late 1960s through early 70s in Vietnam, you know, plane after plane just dumping of orange powder. I've met pilots who inhaled the back wind of the orange powder that came back into the cockpit and they describe it being in their hair and in their teeth and their eyes. And we know that these things are carcinogenic. We're still cleaning these things up in other countries. And uh, you know, the Institute of Medicine has done reports on this, but I've, I've read actually the 2000 page Institute of Medicine article, uh, I'm sorry, book um, that was prepared for you know uh, our government to evaluate whether you know, having served in Vietnam, you should be, uh, you know, automatically uh, have a presumptive diagnosis for malignancies and a, a very long list of malignancies. If you ever even step foot in Vietnam, uh, the VA generally will recognize your benefits for healthcare for that. So it's, this is just some of the factors, I think, why our veterans are, they lived around different chemicals than, you know, non-veterans have. Um, 
Thank you, Drew. That, that That is so helpful. And I know that there are departmental responses that you've just mentioned, as well as you know, government activities and policies that are evolving to try to look at how care and the system can continue to adapt and, and manage and support, you know, veterans who would find themselves, you know, uh, with, with such diagnoses. And maybe what you could do is just amplify a little bit about the, the VA system at this time and how it really is ramping up its, its activity, its focus on, as Julio was saying, the early detection of lung cancer and then its downstream treatment. Yeah, well, I, th I think it's important for me to clarify, you know, I'm not on the policy side of the house in, in the VA. Uh, I'm just a physician who works at a VA. I've worked in, I've trained at a few different VAs, the Nashville VA when I was a medical student at Vanderbilt and then in Philadelphia, and I was in Richmond, Virginia, and now I'm in Atlanta. Um, but along this journey, I've, I've learned a lot. And of course, I read a lot and there's so much publicly available information um, about about all of this. And, uh, you know, there's there's, there's just a lot of uh, commitment that I've seen that the VA has had towards lung cancer. If you go back into historical archives, back in the 1930s, the VA was one of the first government agencies involved with helping to understand that smoking is associated with lung cancer. And then in the 1950s, the VA was the first uh, entity to do a large lung screening trial with sputum collection and chest <laughs> x-rays. It was a very simple study, but it, it provided the evidence base for where we are today you know, 40, 50, 60 years later, when the National Lung Screening Trial showed that early detection mattered. And along the way, there's been all sorts of people who work at the VA and the research side and the health service side on the clinical side who have continued to use VA resources to keep studying lung cancer. And the VA really hasn't given up on this. And I think it's just often uh, silent in the public eye as far as what it's been doing. But in the last 10 years, for example, it's done some tremendous work. Um, largely because of advocacy by people like yourself, Lori. Uh, you know, the VA launched one of the earliest demonstration projects to see if it could screen all veterans across the country. So the New England Journal paper that showed that screening saves lives was published in 2011. By 2012, authorizations were being made to do a implementation assessment. Um, at the same time, the VA collaborated with the NIH and the Department of Defense to create a proteonomics project called the Apollo Project. It then funded a clinical research trial that I'm involved in, which is looking at early stage disease, whether a surgical lobectomy is uh, really superior to steroid radiation. Um, and just this past week, they announced uh, an effort to develop a large network of uh, up to 18 VA medical centers that are part of a national project called the Lung Cancer Precision Oncology Program that boosts lung screening even more than activities that are ongoing right now and also make sure that the highest quality clinical trials are available to veterans or seeking care at these facilities but above and beyond that the va has some of the largest data banks uh for biorepositories and you know biomarker testing it has what's called the national precision oncology program and this lung precision oncology program is going to be gathering even more information to inform that database so that the VA now is actually leading, uh, you know, cancer care and research and development. We often hear about the accolades of large name academic centers, you know, up in Boston or Baltimore or San Francisco or Los Angeles. But at the end of the day, you know, the VA can do projects that are a much, much bigger scale just because of the sheer numbers of veterans that we have. You know, we've got about 5,000 plus veterans diagnosed with lung cancer every year um, that are, who receive their mm -hmm. care in the healthcare system. And I would just like to highlight real quick, the VA is a, a huge monster. It has a budget that's growing, seems like a year by year, over $200 billion in annual funding. That's billion with a B. Uh, and every October, it gets that reappropriation from Congress, usually, um, without much delay. And it has three different agencies. It has a benefit side. It has a cemetery side, you know, manages, you know, Arlington and a bunch of beautiful cemeteries all across the country. But then it's got this third wing, which is the healthcare. And we estimate about 20 million veterans are, you know, alive in the U.S. today, but only about 9 million of them, million of them are accessing the healthcare so side of the house. So when I say nine, when I say about 5,000 veterans are diagnosed with lung cancer, that, those are just the ones who are diagnosed with lung cancer in the VA. 
there's probably been more than 10,000 veterans at large in this country who are diagnosed with lung cancer year after year after year. We definitely need to do some more studies, elegant studies, to see if we're seeing more lung cancer in non-smokers in veterans versus non-veterans. But we're definitely seeing non-smoker veterans who haven't smoked, like Julio, who are unfortunately diagnosed with stage four disease at time of diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's so interesting, and I know Dr. Das, you know, you're you're working not very far from Atlanta, and Drew in in Alabama. But talk with us about your your practice. How are you managing your outreach, your connection to the community? and the services that you're providing there? So I'm a medical oncologist and um, I have an additional background in healthcare quality and safety. So a lot of my work is focused on not just providing the highest quality of lung cancer care, but making sure that care is equitable and accessible and safe and um, available across the board, in a, especially in a state like Alabama, where there's a lot of disparities in terms of um, distance and socioeconomic barriers and uh, lots of other um, issues that we tackle every day. But I think working at the VA has, uh, I have the support system that I need to make all of this work. I feel like I work in um, a great network uh, in, in sort of it's all under one umbrella but in terms of having primary care, having access to a lung cancer navigator for every patient that has a new suspected lung cancer. I have my own social worker. I have access to supportive care services all under one roof to say, um, without having to send my patients to multiple different places for workup. So I think one of the things that really works out for uh, veterans in my practice is they get all the care under one roof. They are able to uh, get that care fairly quickly. Um, if they have a VA close to them, you know, we take care of them and all of all of my staff and all of my physicians are uh, academic oncologists who also practice at UAB, which is our academic affiliate. So we get all access to, um, you know, all the newer techniques, all the training. Um, so we provide the same standard of care that they would get at a tertiary care center at the VA, which I think is something that is not often known to a lot of veterans out there. Um, another thing that I feel um, is a great part of my practice is working as a VA oncologist is my patients have access to all the FDA approved therapies without having the additional barrier of financial toxicity that goes with um, lung cancer and in general any cancer therapies these days. So um, we see a lot of patients, even though they have secondary insurance or other insurance, um, come back to the VA and um, I'm happy and I'm excited that I'm able to provide them the therapies that they need without their families having to go through all the trouble that you go through as a, as a provider um, and as a caregiver with the costs that are associated with treatment, which I think is uh, an amazing part of working with the system. Boy, is that just music to so many people's ears um, on several fronts that that your focus is with a multidisciplinary team that includes nurses and social workers because they are as important to all of this and even care coordinators in that respect, you know, as an oncologist is, as um, as a radiation oncologist as Drew is. Um, it, it, that is just, it, it's essential to ensuring that people are navigated um, in that individualized, personalized way, that multidisciplinary touch point is, is absolutely central to that. But you're also touching on information that, and I, I, I just literally, the purpose of the living room is to try to inform and to, to uh, help uh, guide, you know, those who would not even know this, have this information available as well. How are you trying to communicate these um, very important services and uh, opportunities to, to those who would benefit from this? Um, I think a lot of the, the information and all the services that we have, I know some of these services are not standardized across the board, so different VAs have different flavors of this, but most of everything that I touched upon is available at the VA. Um, you know, once the veteran is plugged into the VA system through their primary care provider, all of this is available to them under the same system. So they don't really have to go to another clinic, another building. It's all in the same 
uh, healthcare system, the records are available. I don't have to go digging for or asking for records from another place. Uh, but I, you know, we, we could probably do better with disseminating this information in terms of what's available at the VA, but I think that's where opportunities like this, where we get to come and talk as physicians and providers about right. all the wonderful things we have at the VA, I think um, is incredibly helpful. And I know a lot of our patients, uh, you know, they speak for our care. They, you know, it's a lot of word of mouth. Um, and um, I love having that relationship with my patients where they will go tell other veterans about what wonderful care they got at the Birmingham VA and that they recommend that um, that their friend or somebody who was with them come see us at the VA. Um, you know, we have, like I said, it's a comprehensive care all the way from being screened to getting their diagnosis. We have a wonderfully established lung mass clinic. We have um, just everything that we need to take our veteran through the entire journey, which is a very difficult journey, being diagnosed with lung cancer, making sure that we're there with them every step of the way uh, from screening to um, you know diagnosis, treatment, and whatever comes after that in terms of supportive care. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Julio, if I could ask you, uh, as you as you've gone through your journey, um, how did you encounter barriers that that if you were thinking through this, that organizations like ourselves and even the department itself need to think about and fix? I mean, tell us about how you gathered your information and if you found your through the system one that was fully supportive or are there things we can do to continue to refine and continue to help vets access information and access care yes um i'm glad you asked that question because i, I was in a unique situation where i'm located at fort benning georgia and uh, my nearest major va medical uh, oncology it's birmingham or mm -hmm. atlanta so that that would be a probably an hour and a half to two hour drive one way to get those services mm -hmm. through the va but fortunately um you know one of the barriers was the fact that i felt like i was by myself in an island hold, holding mm -hmm. this big bucket full of stuff and i didn't know yeah. what to do with it you know and and uh, i do have a pcm here locally but they're not really uh prepared or knowledgeable to handle those things like i was telling you i was mis not misdiagnosed for 10 months mm -hmm. before i was identified as having lung cancer. So it to me, um, it, it was just, it was overwhelming because I, I spent a lot of time on the phone trying to figure out, you know, how am I gonna get help? And, you know, I, I went through the referral process and all that, but thank God, you know, the VA has a community care program, which allows a, a army, well, I mean, it, it allows vets to seek their own medical, uh, professionals nearby to provide medical care for them and the VA pays 100%. So, mm -hmm. you know, once I found out that I could do that, it, it facilitated me to to go and, but I had to do my own research. I had a, you know, wh what, where's the nearest civilian cancer center? You know, wh what, is, what is a good doctor, you know, because, you know, when when you when you get diagnosed with this with this life sentence, you know death sentence. I call it now, but it's a life sentence now. But at the beginning, it was a death sentence. Um, you're like, you know, I, I've got to get the best doctor I can to to figure this thing out and move forward and get the best medical care and, and treatment so I can live longer. And that's what you totally focus on. But I I I I feel lucky that we have this uh, this community care program. That helped me a lot, and I was able to connect with a doctor locally here at the John B. Amos Cancer Center, uh, which is mm -hmm. a fairly decent center. But you know, it's nothing like you know, uh, Birmingham or Atlanta and Emory and those, those big fancy places. But it also the other good part about the VA is you can get a second opinion. So even if you go to a civilian doctor. You can go somewhere else to get a second opinion and the BA will pay for that, you know, pay for all the all the testing, everything. 
and and this way you 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 figure out what is going to be your best your best standard of care for what what you're being uh identified as having and you know what's going to work for you but it's a it's it's a it's a very difficult process uh cuz i was not fortunate to live in atlanta and and you know have the capabilities to go to to a nice center you know where dr drew runs his his show uh, but here it's a lot different for for a vet and i could not connect with a vet that had the disease that i had you know i mean it was just i was i was on my own and then I was having yeah. some serious problems mentally that I couldn't even pick up the phone. I couldn't think straight, you know, it, it's just, it, it, so that those, those were the challenges that I faced up front and also the stigma, you know, once everybody find mm -hmm. out, oh man, you, you got, you know, lung cancer stage four, man, you're, you're a dead man. You know, everybody looks at you like you, you know, you, you did it to yourself or, you know, I, I mean, it's just a bad stigma. It was just, it was a bad experience to say the least uh but once again once you get your bearings and you and you find out that there's there there's ways for you to make yourself better and obviously my family had a lot to do with it my wife you know she she's my rock if it wasn't for her i wouldn't even be talking to you today i honestly think i wouldn't be alive today so you know we you know we're tough guys and uh, as vets and you know we we take a lot of stuff but there's a point point in time in your life where you need to reach out and, and get all the help you can um so mm -hmm. i i started getting connected with the go to foundation i started educating myself uh you know the internet can be dangerous uh, i i every time i opened the internet and looked at my disease i was going to die next week so you know I, I stopped doing that and um but the the best advice i can say is you know you 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 have to you, you have to get a grip of yourself educate yourself find an organization that you feel comfortable communicating with uh but once again the go to foundation got me to the next next level hooked me up with a person they call a, a battle buddy uh that mm -hmm. you can that has the same disease kind of sort of the same treatment you've been uh, uh set up for and they're a couple of years ahead of you so you can chat with them you can you know uh get lessons learned ask questions and you know just educating yourself it's 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 beneficial to your health just mm -hmm. uh in, in a nutshell Julio, you even mentioned um you know even tough guys um need some help and i know when my mom was diagnosed you know she was one that was she was a tough one in the family so it's it's at times it's very hard to um accept help um but it is so important and it's something that we educate everyone who um is diagnosed to have that person who can be there and encourage them and help them take in this massive dose of information that that you're just now learning so even the tough guys i like that um mm -hmm. need help i like that I know it the way you're sharing this, Julio, just again, it is um it shows strength and courage and and acknowledging vulnerability um that that so few feel that they want to be able to you know to to highlight, but it also shows um um that you're Again, this word of hope, the, we, we can be hopeful now in a way that we probably couldn't have been 20 years ago. And we, we, we use the term silver linings often to really look at what can be a dark cloud that certainly now for our community has very, very strong silver linings. When you look at the opportunity now to screen for the disease at the earliest stages where you can uh, treat, where you can manage it and even be cured from it, the number of drugs that have been approved and the new therapies, 
um, in the last five years versus the last 50 years. It's extraordinary how we are developing uh, more targeted and personalized strategies and um, innovative, um, even surgical techniques and radiological techniques that are advancing survivorship. And it all comes down to a sense of community for you as a patient and for those that are giving care to you as well. They're all a part of this and, and just finding a place to, to know that there's hope, there's resilience, there's um, opportunities, because you should never have anyone say, no, nothing you can do, go home and get your things in order. There's, there's not gonna, we shouldn't be accepting that at this day and age for our community. So, um, but Drew, it's, it is interesting. Um, there are some new initiatives within the VA that are really looking at how to improve this system-wide management. You've been at the center of these. They're very uh, exciting studies, whether it's through VA PALS, a Valor study, um, and other initiatives that are being launched. And if you want to touch on those so that our com the, the veteran community knows what, what the VA is doing to even ramp up its efforts beyond the many that you've just laid out. Yeah, I, I, I'd love to kind of amplify some of the things that were, were said so so far because that speaks to what you're discussing, Lori. Uh, first of all, I just got to say, you know, Julio, I'm so glad you pulled yourself out of that dark place that, you know, this disease takes people to. Otherwise, we would have never met. And I'll tell you, our, our, our handful of conversations that we have had have always uh, lifted me up. Um, I often talk to my colleagues who are clinicians uh, and I ask them, have you ever talked to a patient with metastatic lung cancer outside of the clinic? And it's unbelievable, so few of us have. And until I got involved with this organization and getting out and involved with advocacy and meeting people like you, Julio, you know, um, it was just, I don't wanna say business as usual, but it's very different because in a clinic room, the patient's in a different uh, kind of setting because it, there's a power imbalance, right? As much as we don't wear our white coat, I stop wearing a tie, try to, you know, be a pal, it's, it's not the same, even though veterans are, are very different. When I see a veteran at the VA, it's a lot different than when I see a veteran at Emory. When they're in the VA, I feel like, you know, they, they just look me in the eye and I look at them like, why are you looking at me so much? And I can, I finally figured it out after a decade because, because the veteran's looking at me like, hey, buddy, this is my house that you're in. <laughs> I'm the visitor in this appointment. So, so with that said, because of that commitment, you know, the VA has is really there to serve all the veterans that have access to health. The doors are open. Whatever Congress authorizes, we'll get patients, you know, their approvals to get health care in the VA. Um, you know, we have lots of resources at the 170 plus medical centers, but we've got over a thousand clinics. And as, as you know, down, down by where you live, Julio, and where a lot of other veterans live, there isn't a big box hospital with operating rooms and emergency room and all those things. And we now have the authority to leverage community care to get people out into the community. And, you know, the big box VAs are still there. If you, if you for example, aren't getting biomarker testing, you know, you could just contact Dr. Doss and she'll make sure your sample gets sent to the VA National Precision Oncology Program. And that's one of the initiatives I think that we should all be aware of. I mean, assembling one of the largest databases of uh, tissue samples with foundation medicine testing and other, you know, biomarker testing. And you may say, well, there's other academic centers that do this as well, but veterans stay in the healthcare system, usually all the way through their entire journey. And so the database is much more robust. You don't have missing pieces of data where some civilian was at a community hospital, got upset at their doctor and left. And then when you go back and look at those research data, it's not robust enough to really make any meaningful analysis. So You've got this National Precision Oncology Program of the VA, which is an incredible gem uh, in the cancer research realm that the VA is managing. So that's one big initiative. We've got this other initiative that, Julio, I don't know if you haven't signed up for, I, I strongly encourage you to do so, and all veterans are on this call, called the Million Veterans Program, the MVP. The VA is literally collecting blood on one million veteran and healthcare enrollees and the more MVP enrollees that have cancer, the larger data set. So we'll have tissue 
that has their biomarker of the cancer, and then we'll have their blood that says these are the genes that they were born it, born with, and we can go back and kind of really untangle this genetic mess regarding was it a chemical induced cancer or was it a genetic predisposition to cancer? We know from the 1940s that mouth from mouse models of cancer, cancers behave differently. You take a mouse and you pump it with a lot of toxic chemicals, that cancer behaves very differently. This is the stuff I was studying when I was a medical student doing a fellowship uh, through the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And then there's other mice where you can genetically modify it and those cancer blossom and behave completely differently as well. So the MVP of the VA is really gonna help us untangle a lot of the mysteries of this awful, awful disease. So those are two, two big initiatives. The other ones, you know, we've got this VA partnership to increase access to lung screening, which received a very generous gift from the BMSF, the Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation, through the VA Secretary's Office. That's helped stand up uh, 15 uh, medical centers in the VA with structured screening programs similar to how GoTo has those programs. Uh, uh, Dr. Doss and I both are two of the 15 have two of the 15 VA pals uh, sites operating on this. And as I mentioned, this new precision oncology program that's ongoing, uh, it was just announced last week and is going to be standing up more precision directed cancer. But I do want to, before we run out of time, point out that, you know, this memorandum of agreement with the highest ranking official in the Veterans Health Administration, Dr. Richard Stone signed with you, Lori, you know, opens up this door now for even more expertise to be at the table. So as I've tried to point out, the VA is this huge machine. There's a lot of activities in lung cancer screening and care and research and partnering with community for co increasing community engagement. But now, uh, you know, GoTo is able to help veterans like, well, let's say Julio knows five or six of his colleagues who are at risk for lung cancer. And the VA estimates about 900,000 veterans, at least who are registered with the VA, so about one in 10 are at risk for lung cancer and should be screened. And there might not be a low-dose CT scanner close to Julio that's convenient. He's working a full-time job. He's not going to drive all the way to Atlanta to get a screening scan. And this is where if there's go-to center designated screening centers, this is fantastic to get more and more veterans screened so that we don't leave any veteran behind. And then, of course, we've got our cancer care continuum you know, um, centers that we can help veterans identify where should I go. Julio earlier mentioned he's got cancer. The VA is too far. He wants to go in the community. The VA says, sure, we'll give you an authorization. But the nice people who he was talking to community care, they're not cancer specialists. They're not lung cancer specialists. Julio and I hadn't met. If so, he would have called me on my cell phone. And I would have told him, hey, here, let me call some friends and find out where a good place to go is. But now, you know, this would be fantastic if there's just some like go-to resource that pay veterans can go to to find out where to go for their treatment. I'll tell you, this go-to name is, is still like, it, it just keeps growing on me every, every month. Um, <laughs> this would be fantastic so that when they go in the community under a VA authorization, they at least can have some information and make a good decision about where they go. Lots of things going on. I know it. It's so wonderfully said. And, and at the end of the day, it is about making sure that veterans have information that they need, know that there's a community that surrounds them and cares for them, and knowing that there are options and that if you could be at risk, where to go, what to ask, what to expect, if you are diagnosed, how to navigate that treatment pathway that suits you as the individual that you are in the most personalized way. And that's what we are, uh, our, our goal is in, in working with the VA and in this partnership is to make sure that the veterans have what they need. Um, no different I'd than the civilian I just, that we work with. I'd, I'd love to highlight one of the earliest things that we worked on, Lori, after the agreement was signed. So GoTo Foundation has a hotline, right? Veterans call, they have questions, and your staff has done the best that they can to answer the questions. Well, when we reviewed some of the questions and answers, we realized, wow, there's, there's a lot more information that could be provided to veterans. And so this sort of partnership, I just want to highlight how important and valuable partnerships are, where we were able to, you know, get some people to look at your script so that when veterans ask questions, 
we can give them more precise information, guide them to the right place so they're not just lost, uh, not knowing where to go. Because as, as Julio pointed out, <laughs> it can be complicated. Uh, but if you if you have a part a buddy uh, to get guide you through there, and if go to can help with some of that bandwidth of communicating, especially with veterans who don't have health benefits just yet, a lot of veterans are walking around who are eligible, but they just don't know. And if GoTo can help them get eligible, that would be fantastic so that they have options and more resources to get their care and, you know, God forbid, you know, you know, not go bankrupt from lung cancer. Yeah. Yeah. So Dr. Doss, and I, it's a question really to all of you. If, if you are a veteran that's listening to this, um, what I should say, the veterans who are listening to this, what advice would you be giving them? What would we want them to know from your standpoint? I think a lot of what's already been said before that the VA is committed and there is a, a, a strong team of people um, just across the spectrum within the VA system that want to take care of you and want to make sure that you get provided um, the state-of-the-art care, everything that's accessible to any patient, um, lung cancer, uh, if they were not in the system. So, um, you know, we've heard about some of the challenges and barriers and not knowing exactly what to do, where to go. Uh, but I think the key point is to continue to ask questions, continue to communicate, if you know you could be eligible for benefits to make sure you go ahead and get those benefits, uh, you can choose not to get care at the VA um, down the line if that is something that's not best suited for you. But knowing that within this healthcare system, there are resources that are invaluable, things that, um, you know, again, we talked about some of that, the financial toxicity that's associated with care, having all your care available in one roof, um, all the way from screening to supportive care services, having medications, having access to social work, um, mental health um, support that you need. And um, something that is not very visible is a lot of the physicians and the staff members that work at a VA also have specializations and work in academic centers. So essentially you're getting the same level of care you would get at an academic center. You make sure of that. And that is something I would take pride in. So um, don't dismiss the VA, um, you, know, you know, give us a chance. Um, there's a lot of us who choose to work at the VA because we believe the mission and we um, really mm -hmm. enjoy taking our veterans. So Leo had mentioned that he was a couple hours away from the nearest VAs, one in Atlanta, one in Birmingham. How do these veterans know that they have an opportunity to go and visit community centers that you guys have partnerships with? Do they, are they told that right, right, off, right off the bat? Um, Julio, how did you find out that you didn't have to travel an hour and a half, two hours? Uh, my PCM gave me the options of either going to the you know, she said you could go Birmingham, Emory, or Atlanta VA, which is kind of a triangle. It's all the same distance. So I had the option to select where I wanted to go, which is great. It was not force fed to me uh, when I when I received the referral from my PCM. So once again, you know, uh, there, there are some great people. I know like Dr. Drew kept saying, this is a big machine. And sometimes you feel like you're lost in it, but once you get connected, I think everyone has great intentions uh, to get you the best medical care available, and it's up to you. You know, you like you said earlier, you know, you could decide to go to a civilian doctor or whatever, or go to a name brand hospital, uh, but you're still going to get the best medical care that you want to get, you know, because you're going to have to make that decision. Do I want to go to Birmingham? Do I want to go to Columbus here, five, ten minutes away? Do I want to drive, you know, four hours to Emory back and forth? You know, those are choices that you have to make what you feel comfortable with, you know, uh, how uh, how you communicate with the oncologist, how, how that relationship, you trust what's going on. Um, but the good thing is uh, there there is I didn't I guess I had a bad bad uh, impression or, or thought that, you know, I was just going to be a number and, you know, 
people are just going to push me through the system and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, throw me out later on. But I, I found out that there is, there is some people that are very special that do this line of work that I would not want to be, I wouldn't want to be an oncologist. I don't think I could do that. You know, I'd rather go out and look for bad guys and bad girls, mm -hmm. but, uh, they're, they're angels. They, they have a purpose in life and I thank God for them. Um, I will say that as a, I, 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 sorry, um, quality and safety and, and work on process improvement. This is great feedback that we get from veterans about this whole process of, you know, do I get care at the VA? Do I go to the community? And I will say that the VA has put in some effort. I'm part of a study that's looking at our existing community care service, how that's working, what are things that we could do to make that process more seamless uh, for our veterans, and really doing a quality check um, on the places that we send our patients, VA and otherwise, to see if our veterans are getting the same quality of care across the spectrum. So the VA is investing in looking at that. It's not just a process that's in place. It's something that we're looking to constantly improve upon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. I know we're I would, getting. I would. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I would Drew. just add one last thing, Lori. Yeah, just one yeah. last thing to to build on that. I think a closing comment would be that you know the VA is happy to help be at the center of of any veteran's care. Uh, we have some of the uh, the best telehealth systems in the country. We can go across state lines. Uh, you have you can get access to a lung cancer specialist if you would like, um, and you know. For example, if Julio wanted to get a second opinion from Birmingham or Atlanta, he wouldn't have to drive. We could set up a video conference and quickly review his records uh, and do all that and then help guide, you know, any recommendations that he wants through telehealth as well. Wonderful. Um, we could talk about these opportunities, advice to give, uh, ways to think about this, how to connect with with those that are are really there to be helpful and, and supportive in every way. I just want anyone listening and everyone listening to know, um, please, if you are wondering if you should be screened, if you are having treatment, need more questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to go to Foundation and certainly to a VA center that's close to you. We want to be there to support you and help you because we know we have the opportunity to save your life and improve the quality of it. And that's what we are here as, um, as we say, your life is our mission together as a partnership. Um, uh, to be continued, and Andy, I know that you have some closing remarks. So let me turn this back to you and to say thank you to all of the panelists who took time to be with us tonight and share their incredible stories and, um, and the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much and for giving me the opportunity. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Julio, you're going to have many, many more opportunities after this, um, <laughs> this live program. Um, we, need, we need thousands hey, one, of... Um, one, one, fi one final one. note to all my war fighters, all my vets. You're not alone. There's some great people out there to help you. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. See, once a veteran, always, once a military signing enrollee, mm -hmm. this guy, he keeps serving, doesn't he? <laughs> yes, he does. He, and, wants, and I, he wants to serve again. I, I'm definitely not kidding you when you're going to be getting a lot of requests after tonight's, um, but we need more people like you. So thank you for taking the time to come and tell your story tonight. Um, a couple things. Um, Lori did touch on this. Um, if you, if any of you know a veteran or know one that is at risk um, uh, or has been diagnosed, please feel, um, please let them reach out and tell them to reach out to support at go to foundation.org. Um, we have a great team on staff that are willing and able and ready to help anyone. Uh, another um, item to bring up, Bonnie um, Adario has pre-launched uh, her book, um, a book. It's called The Living Room, A Lung Cancer Community of Courage. It highlights 22 patients and it's now uh, available for pre-orders um, on Amazon. Our next living room, our final one of the year, is on December 15th, um, third Tuesday of the month at, um, at 5.30 Pacific Standard Time.
Uh, let's see, latest news and um, most recent joint statement on COVID and lung cancer is also on gotofoundation.org, kind of a hot topic as um, we speak. Um, also, very important, please consider uh, logging into lungcancerregistry.com and participating in our lung cancer registry. It's very um, much appreciated and so, so much uh, valuable information are coming out of that. Uh, again, thank you to all the panelists, all of you watching live um, or post live and Peninsula Television. They're the ones that make this happen. Um, to our supporters, uh, we definitely acknowledge that we would not be able to put on this living room without supporters, um, our industry supporters, Amgen, AstraZeneca, Boehringer Ingelheim, Bristol Myers Squibb, Foundation Medicine, Genentech, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, Lilly, Merck, Novartis, and Takeda. Your support has um, let us educate thousands of, of patients and caregivers and loved ones. So thank you. Oh, I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. And it could be just you and me. We'll be family. Just wait and see. So I will fight if you'll fight. Yeah, I will fight, but only if you'll fight. Oh, we can make it through this like sailors in a tempest. Like sailors in a tempest together. And it could be just you Just wait and see.